Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This week we will look at the history of the sultanates in India starting with Delhi where a slave or a slave commander of the Ghurid Sultan from Afghanistan was appointed to set up base in India. This sult sultanate of Delhi would eventually go on to cover a large part of northern India in Punjab and in the upper Gangetic Valley. This dynasty called the Mamluk dynasty, which was not really a dynasty but a succession of sultans, built a number of very important monuments such as the Qutub Minar, uh, the Alai Darwaza and also an unfinished minar that you see in the Qutub complex at Delhi. Their architecture derives very heavily from Afghanistan where the Ghurids came from. In fact, the minaret of Jam is one of the inspirations for the Qutub Minar, a victory tower, not a minaret for a mosque as is commonly believed. We will look at the Qutub Minar in some detail at another point, but suffice it to say that the artisans used in the creation of the Qutub Minar were all local, though the conceptualization and the design were from Afghanistan. Therefore, while you have large calligraphic bands in Arabic, you also have the stone ornamentation of local temple traditions. The Delhi Sultan would eventually be Ekmanta. The Delhi Sultanate would eventually be ruled by a number of dynasties such as the Khiljis, the Tughlaqs, the Lodis, the Sayyids, and the last one of them, the most famous the Mughals who also came initially as the Sultans of Delhi. Now under the Khiljis and the Tughlaqs there were conquests from the Delhi Sultanate over the complete Indian subcontinent and as soon as the Tughlaq rule became weak in these areas the whole country splintered into a number of smaller Sultanates. The Delhi Sultanate starts in the 1290s and is powerful into the 1340s when Muhammad bin Tughlaq has a very ambitious program to bring the whole of India under his command. In fact, he shifts his capital all the way to Daulatabad, which we will look at this week as well. This whole move of capital from Delhi to Daulatabad is a failure, he moves capital back and as soon as his power, the power of the Delhi Sultanate is weakened, the power of the Tughlaq Kingdom is weakened, all regions of India quickly declare independence and have his governors declare themselves new sultans. The trajectory of architecture in these different regions is different from this point on. But while you have a hundred years of the Delhi Sultanate, they are building all over India in a style that has been sometimes called the Pathan style, a label we do not use, but really a style of the early Sultanate. Now this style usually has what are called battered walls, a feature that derives from a tradition of building in mud brick as you have in Afghanistan. But there is also an incorporation of all forms of local elements. A hundred years of the Delhi Sultanate is completely disrupted by a great dynasty in Central Asia called the Timurids under their Sultan Timur. And we shall look at how that has an impact on all the Sultanates of Delhi very shortly. Now Timur invades India in the 1390s really limits himself to the 
Sultanate of Delhi. But his name and fame and architectural creations have a very big impact on all these small sultanates across multiple regions in India who have declared independence from Delhi. Timur is known to have taken home with him to Samarkand, his capital, artisans from all the areas he captures. Not only does he come and raid India, he also goes west. He has invasions of Iran, of uh, the Seljuks into Central Asia towards Europe. In fact, he builds himself a very big empire. The greatest of the Timurid connections that India will have is that the Mughals will claim, and rightly so, that they are actually direct descendants of Timur and they call themselves Timurids. Timur's empire spreads across large parts of the Middle East, Central Asia and towards India. At his capital city of Samarkand, he builds grand squares in which you have these big portals, these Ivans that we will see in India as well under the Mughals. These Ivans are just facades that flank either courtyards or big open squares beyond which might or might not be buildings. You have an aesthetic of decorating everything with surface tiles. You have big bulbous domes, sometimes double domes. And it is this kind of portal that will have an enormous impact not only on the Sultanate architecture of India. In fact, the Registan Square in Samarkand, which you see in this picture, is going to be a model for the kingdom of the Bahamanis with their capital at Bidar. They will build themselves a portal like this in their palace with exactly the same iconography. But this Ivan with the two flanking minarets is something that the Mughals will also borrow. Imagine this building with a number of small cupolas or chhatris on top and suddenly you have a Mughal portal. The Timurids also will build big Ivan facades as you see when you look at a building from behind and these facades contain a completely different structure behind them. So while this building might be a simple building with a dome on top, from the front it looks a lot more impressive and a lot more different as in a Potemkinian facade. But the greatest achievement of Timur's rule is being able to combine various kinds of arts, whether it's manuscript making, which is to say book making, painting, architecture, tile work and so on. And this is done by using exactly the same modular systems, the same geometry, only to different scales for different kinds of applications. And so Timurid arts, while they have a unified character to them irrespective of medium, are backed by scholarly treatises on how to build, how to build forms such as the Mukarnas, which is made by putting in pieces of molded tiles together. You will see similar kinds of things in the Delhi Sultanate where there are attempts at making some kind of mukarnas, but again the local crafts tradition has not evolved in that direction yet. But most importantly, what is called the Topkapa scroll is our window into how all kinds of arts are unified by systems of geometry. This is an important workman's scroll in which you have details of all kinds of geometrical applications which can be used when they are scaled up or scaled down to create everything from leather bindings on books to large palaces. This is what the drawings look like and again while maintaining proportions if you can scale up these drawings they can be used to embellish the walls of a palace with tiles. If they are reduced down to a very tiny scale they can be used for the elimination of manuscripts, in the creation of carpets, 
in what you have up here which is uh, small leather covers for books this kind of geometry is not really to be mystified it is a question of applying simple geometrical techniques that you can apply across a range of arts to book covers which look like carpets to book uh, frontispieces such as this and also these are all examples from miniature paintings where this kind of geometry is used as ornament to depict various kinds of surfaces, textures, buildings and settings. Again a pastiche of the same. Now while this is all from miniature paintings notice that these are all examples of how buildings have been rendered in various kinds of paintings and the buildings themselves would actually have borne the same geometry except at a very different scale. So a lot of Sultanate architecture in India will be very heavily shaped by the idea that you can take surface decoration, scale it up or down and use it for a variety of ornamental purposes. Geometry is one of the disciplines in which the Islamic Renaissance of the 10th, 11th century played a big role. There were excellent geometricians who devised techniques of making all kinds of patterns, tessellations, uh, mirroring, a variety of techniques in which to embellish buildings. Taking something like a very simple square you can rotate it, make connecting lines in all directions and then shade certain patterns of the shapes that have been created and lo and behold what you have is a very common motif used in decoration. Therefore this understanding of scale, of proportion of grids and of symmetry is very important but the central factor in all this is graph paper which we know from the 10th 11th century becomes quite common across the Islamic world. The other big thing that is brought in as a technology by the Sultanates are the water systems which allow them to build cities in place where you could have never imagined them as opposed to the Indus Valley civilization which we have seen where you have a problem of excess water that needs to be drained out as opposed to Indian cities that you have which are always along river banks where you have a perennial source of water. What you start having is the large scale construction of dams and cisterns in the Buddhist period to store water. In fact, if you go to the Kanheri caves, you can see carved into the rock various kinds of devices to channel and pool water. But all this relies on open systems. We have a great tradition of step wells, of all kinds of kundas, but what the sultans do for the first time as you see in this picture of the house khas is build massive artificial reservoirs with a number of palace buildings on the side and also bring with them what is called the Persian wheel by which you can harvest water and a gear transforms the circular laborious movement of a pair of oxen into a vertical wheel so that the water can be pulled out. We can see examples of this all across India as in this uh, fort of Kalyani in Karnataka where the ramp is where oxen would go up and down, the water would be collected in tanks, fed into conduits, sometimes into underground pipes from where it would be transported great distances. 
in Gujarat, the sultans of Gujarat in the 15th century built the Hauze Kutbi, now called Kankaria Lake, a perfectly circular water body in which the water sluices you see on the further side would channel in water. A whole system of hydrology was understood where water would collect, how it would naturally channel itself into depressions and low-lying areas and how it could be tapped to fill up great reservoirs and how from these reservoirs the water would be distributed through a network of underground pipes into settlements that the sultans built. The other system that was brought over particularly from Iran was the system of what are called kanats where you tap into a higher water table quite a distance away, maybe 12-15 kilometers away and essentially create a horizontal tunnel with a very mild slope punctuated by vertical shafts which will bring water continuously and perennially to areas that you desire a water supply in. Typical kanats are punctuated by these kinds of vertical shaft holes and you see this across the Deccan plateau. What this kind of technology allows is for the first time you can build cities purely for strategic reasons, strategic militarily or strategic in terms of mercantile value. You can build a city not based on where a river flows but on factors completely extraneous to that. And therefore you have cities like uh, Bidar and Ahmadnagar and even Ahmedabad which are all possible in places that do not have perennial rivers flowing right by. And therefore you have systems like this that convey water over very large distances but allow the defensible siting of sultanate cities. The features you see most commonly when you have water systems that bring water from far away are underground tunnels and conduits like the ones on top. So first you have a masonry lined tunnel through which water will flow or you might have a block of masonry through which you have clay pipes that convey water. But all these systems will have what you have at the bottom uh, siphon towers and settling towers. So you will have punctuated at regular intervals on the pipes certain kinds of mechanisms by which not only is the pressure of the water equalized but there is also a way in which there is sedimentation along its flow. This is what those towers look like. It is not impressive architecture but totally utilitarian. The value is enormous. The aesthetic is non-existent. The last large-scale example of this ironically is not with the Mughals who are very conservative when it comes to building cities. Most Mughal cities are on the banks of a river in very traditional ways of water harvesting. The Marathas with their capital at Pune decide to embrace this sultanate system of water conveyance from a large distance and this is the large large scale implementation we see of this program where the water supply still runs. It has been actively modeled by scholars in recent years and it is exactly the same as sultanate period settlements. So ironically the great sultanate legacy of water management is not picked up by the Mughals but by the Marathas. Thus there are a few important things we have to understand about the sultanates in India. The sultanates start off with Delhi where you have the first sultans who build themselves a new capital 
first around the area called Meroli and then at Tughlaqabad and then a string of capitals is built in the same vicinity. Delhi is important because it controls the gateway to the Gangetic Plain. It is at the edge of the desert and that is where all traffic from the northwest is going to come through. The early Sultanate is set up by military slaves of the Gurid Sultans who have appointed them to take care of the province. They soon declare independence, build monuments like the Qutb Minar, like the Quwatul Islam Mosque and leave behind a number of ruins in that area. The success of the Sultans continues through a string of dynasties, the Khiljis and the Tughlaqs, most notably in the 14th century. They will expand their domains to all over India, appoint military commanders in every part, in Gujarat, in Jaunpur, in Bengal, in the Deccan, in Mandu, in Malwa, in Khandesh, and all and even in Vijayanagar, but all of them will rebel and quickly create their own independent kingdoms. They will follow a policy of really defining local identity through new languages that are emerging, but also through regional architectural idioms. The architecture of the Delhi Sultanate, which is widespread for about 25 years across the whole India is quickly taken over by regional architecture of new sultanates that emerge. But towards the end of the 14th century, a new Central Asian king, Timur, has arrived on the scene and he sets the tone and the tenor for what a good sultan is and it is his idol that everybody will try to follow. They will want to be kings like Timur. They will want to build buildings like him. They will want to patronize the arts like him. The other things that come in along with an aspiration towards being kings like Timur is a deep sense of geometry and also the technologies of conveyance of water. Geometrical understanding, water technologies, aspirations to be a king like Timur combined with various regional sensibilities is what makes the regional sultanates of India very unique. And we shall see examples of how these different sultanates vary and eventually we will take a look at the fort of Daulatabad which is one of the grandest sultanate period forts continuously occupied into the 20th century. Thank you.